Good to be back and to see your bright faces. Um, we have a quiz or a midterm next week on Wednesday, right? So uh, we will cover everything up until the um, current lecture. So the end of the today's lecture we will be covering um, on the midterm. And uh, to give you guys some sense of the midterm, I will have uh, David send out some previous tests so you can play with it and uh, uh, try it out. As before, um, you'll have an opportunity to bring in a sheet of paper with your notes on it. So you don't need to memorize anything. You can just write it out. No, okay. No, no books, right? No books. Okay. No books, no internet, just a sheet of paper. The idea being that, um, at least when I look at the courses that I took, by making a sheet of paper, you're summarizing for yourself things that you know. And it's good to have a summary. OK. Front and back. Front and back. Font size of your choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so today I want to talk about the following chapters. Um, let's see. We are going to talk about 6.5. 6.7, and I can see that this pen is not going to make it. Let me see what I can do. It's better, but... There we go. It's better. Okay. So, um, the framework of state estimation that we've been talking about has been applied to the problem of learning in the sense that people um, and other animals have been um, exposed to perturbations, scenarios where they perform an action and there's a, something that affects their behavior. So for example, they may be moving a mouse and when they move the mouse, the, normally the mouse goes here, the cursor goes here, but now all of a sudden the cursor goes here. So there's a perturbation that's added to their actions. And then trial after trial, they learn it. And they're individuals, as they learn, they exhibit some interesting properties in that learning. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about it today and uh, the next couple of lectures. But the notion of state estimation that we've been using has been applied to this framework in thinking about how the brain is estimating this perturbation. This perturbation that's occurring has a state, and the brain is learning what is this perturbation. Um, so uh, some years ago, back when I was a student like you guys, the paradigm that I thought about as a way to explore this problem of learning was one where um, you perform an action, you, you, you pick something up and you move it, and when you move it, you misestimate the mass of that object. So the idea is like you go to pick up a can of, say, Coke, and you think it's full, but it's empty, and so your arm goes like this. So your brain has an estimate of some property of that object, and when you move it, you make an error. And what is that error? It's an error between what you predicted what should happen. Your hand should have moved like this, but it moves like this, and therefore there's a difference between what you predicted and what you observed. Therefore, you update your estimate of the parameter that you're trying to estimate, say the mass of this object. So we didn't want to give people objects to move around. That's kind of clumsy. So what we thought about is that we make a robot that generates basically arbitrary dynamics. So the arm that we built um, was something that can be held. You held the end of it and you moved it. And as you moved it, it generated dynamics, meaning forces, as a function of states. And when it did that, what happened was that it acted as a perturbation on the action that the individual was performing. So you, you, know, you hold this thing and you move it, and you expect it to move in some way, but it moves in a different way. And by the fact that there's a prediction error, Here's where it should have gone. Here's where it went. I have a prediction. I learned to estimate. My brain learns to estimate the dynamics. And trial after trial, people get better. Now, what was interesting about it was that um, people, as they learned it, they performed a number of things that was consistent across individuals. So it really didn't matter if the person was young or old, if they were, um, you know, whatever differences there may be in them, they seem to have regularity. It was a consistent behavior. And one of the things was that, for example, when they learned it, they didn't just learn something about the action that they did, but they also generalized what they learned. So they, they 
extrapolated from the space in which they learned to places they hadn't been. And that was interesting, because you can ask them, why did they extrapolate the way they did? What did that say about the way they represented the task in their brain? Probably the most interesting aspect of this task was that it turned out that you didn't really need um, your conscious ability to recollect that you've done the task to remember that you've done it. So for example, um, you know, if you were to have an experience with this strange machine, this robotic arm, you come and, and you, know, you move it around and you get better at it. You come back tomorrow, you remember that, well, I was in this room before. So you, know, you remember having done the task before. So that recollection is a kind of memory. But it turns out that there are some individuals who don't have that ability. So for example, amnesic individuals can learn things and they experience things, but they may not remember that experience. So there's this famous patient named H.M. Henry. He just died a few years ago. So Henry, when he was uh, a young person um, in his 20s, or early 20s, he suffered from, um, this is now in the 1950s, he was about 20 some years old, he suffered uh, from epilepsy. And uh, he was a, a mill worker in Rhode Island. And uh, um, he, he had a terrible time because occasionally you know he wouldn't be able to maintain his posture he would have seizures he would fall down and then you know after the seizure would end he would get up and he would go about his normal business so he, he suffered from these seizures and these seizures weren't controllable with what they, what was known back then so um, there was a, a, a neurologist in um, uh, Montreal who was performing operations and he went through a, uh, his own doctor told him to go try this, and so he went up there, and um, they, uh, to, to help control these seizures, they removed two parts of his brain called left and right hippocampus, part of the medial, medial part of the temporal lobe. So you, know, you have the temporal lobe, the medial part of it, the middle part of it is called hippocampus, and they removed that. Um, they removed that and it helped a lot. It helped with his seizures. His seizures more or less came under control. But what happened to him was that he no longer remembered the events that took place in the recent past. So for example, he would come and he would meet me. So now I'm up in Boston. We've set up this experiment and we have this room where there's this robot sitting in there. So Henry comes and Henry's now in his 70s or so. And he comes and he's in a wheelchair. Um, not that he can't walk around, it's just easier to you know, walk him from room to room because of his being on his wheelchair. So he comes to the, 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 the robot room and um, he, uh, you know, I, I say hello, thank you for coming. And normally what happens is that people, when they see this machine, they don't touch it. Because it's kind of a weird looking thing. It's aluminum, you know, looks kind of threatening. They just leave it alone. So I, he gets up and I say, okay, sit down in this chair. There's this chair here, you know, so he comes and he sits down. And, and what he does is that he's looking at this thing. And I say, well, go ahead, hold it. So he holds it. He's looking, you know, at his hand. He's moving it around. And I said, no, don't look at your hand. Look up here. And he, up here there's a monitor. And there's a cursor on the monitor. And I say, okay, now move your arm around. He moves your arm around, you see the cursor move around. So he learns, that, okay, so when I do this, this cursor moves up and left and right. And so, okay, so he's looking up at the monitor, looking at the cursor. And then you give him a target, he gives a target up here. So he moves his arm over there and the cursor moves to the target. Pretty good. So he does this again and again and he, you know, he does well. Now, every time he does this, what happens is that um, the computer gives them feedback about the speed by which it's moving. So most people, they, they start this task, they move kind of slow. To encourage them to move fast, you give a beep, you know, not a very good movement, beep, move a little faster. Eventually they move faster. When they move the right speed, the little animation appears on the screen, the thing <laughs> explodes, okay? So he sees this and he says, um, hmm, you know, when I was a kid, I would go to my backyard and I had this Winchester gun, and I would shoot birds. And I like to shoot these kinds of birds, this and that and so forth. And he said it with great joy. You know, the one kind of kept quiet for a while, maybe a minute or two would pass, and he would say, oh, you know, when I was a kid, I would go to my backyard, and I had this gun, and I would shoot this and that bird. And you know, he told me about his backyard, and he lived in Rhode Island, you know, he had this woods in his backyard, and, and so forth. So, this experiment took um, about an hour and a half, and we did four sessions over two days. So he would come, an hour and a half, come back four hours later, do it again, and it comes back the next day, do it again, and so forth. And um, this, this uh, explosion reminded him of him you know, going bird hunting. And he would give it you know, with, this ex with, with this pleasure, he would describe it. Now, after he finished 
doing the task, and I'll tell you about the task in a minute. And, uh, he, he left. He left the room, and he came back a few hours later. And, and you know, this is now about f after lunch, about five hours later or so. And I asked him, you know, how you doing? And have you been here before? No. Have you seen me before? No. Okay. So he gets up now. I said, can you sit in this chair? He sits at this chair, and when he sits at the chair, what he does is very important. He holds the machine without me asking him. He looks up at the monitor and he starts moving it around. So the way I imagine what's happened is that he, his part of his brain knows that somehow this machine is something fun. And that's a fun thing for him to do. Because you know, if he, I think if he had shocked them with it, he probably wouldn't touch it. So he didn't remember consciously having done the task before, but his brain recall that here's how I hold it, here's how I move it. Now what was even more interesting is that um, when he's doing the task, what happens is that you, you have a move, so you move your arm and the robot produces a force. So what, that hap what happens is that you generate a motor command, you, this is, this is your motor command, I add a perturbation, a force to it, let's call that X, and that becomes the consequence of your movement Y. So what you learn to do is to estimate x. So you form an x hat. And by forming an x hat, you generate motor commands that cancel this x hat. So that when I add a perturbation to it, this is removed. So you learn to remove this perturbation that I've given you. What that really means is that if I push you to the right by force, your brain learns to, when I'm generating this movement, to push a little bit to the left. Okay, so that compensates for that perturbation. So the, the meaning of this is that if I were to not produce the force field on that trial, so if, if you expect the force to be to the right, so therefore you push to the left, but now on this trial I don't give you the force field, what happens to your hand is like this. Right? So that's when you expect the can to be full, but it's empty. And so these are called after effects. All right, so he has learned to expect these forces, and he's doing well at the first trial, in the first experimental set. Then he comes back a few hours later. He said, I've never seen this before. I don't know what this is about. He sits in front of the robot. On the very first movement, he go, his arm goes like this. So he expects the force to be there. So part of his brain knows what the forces of this machine is. They know that he knows that this, this machine somehow is a fun thing to use because I want to hold it. I want to look up here. And he knows the kind of forces he needs to produce to produce the, the movement. So um, this was one of a number of experiments that showed that um, despite the fact that the brain may not remember from a cognitive standpoint, from what's called declarative standpoint, that I've done something before, there's other parts of your brain that knows how to do that task. And this dissociation between kinds of memory is one of the hallmarks of neuroscience. That there's different kinds of memories in different parts of our brain. And you know, it's just because you don't think you know how to do something doesn't mean that your brain doesn't know how to do something. Okay. So in the world of adaptation, which is what this is about, you learning to compensate for things. Um, there are a number of experiments that are interesting and tell us information about um, how, how this process of state estimation takes place. And, and, I, and, and today what I want to show you is how we're going to use the common filter to try to understand two sets of experiments that were interesting in terms of the kinds of uh, information they provided the, the, uh, the experimenters. The first, the first set of data that I want to show you has to do so before I do it, are there any questions about what I, the story I just told you? Have you seen the movie? Momento? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, interesting movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's fascinating. You know, I think um, one of the things you guys will see in this class is that the, the concept of state and the concept of estimation is something that, um, you know, I, I will show you, your brain may have multiple estimates of a single thing. So you know you have many parts in your brain, each of them re, you know, provide some potential understanding of what the world is around you. And what's really a miracle is the fact that we feel like one person, despite the fact that there are all these different things in our brain that can have you know, knowledge of various kinds. I may not say that I've ever seen this before, but part of my brain knows that it has seen it before, and it knows how to interact with it. Okay. So the data that I want to show you is the following. Um, 
It has to do with a very simple experiment that you can do fairly easily. It doesn't really require any complicated, um, um, complicated uh, information. So um, the, the, the story goes like this. So typically, what happens in, um, in laboratories that don't have you know, robots, which are a little bit more expensive and things to make, are exploration of tasks where you move, let's say, a, a, a mouse. And, and um, what happens is that as you move the mouse, there's a consequence associated with the cursor moves. Now, to make it a little bit more sophisticated, suppose that your hand is covered by something, and you move your hand, and they, they instrument your hand so that they can measure where your hand is located. And then they, 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 they point a little cursor on top of it so that it's supposed to represent your hand. And what happens is that they give you a target. So here, here, here's a target that they want you to go to. And then you go there, you know, so you, you have your finger there. That's, that's you know, you, you point to the target. That's fine. So now what they do is that they, they impose a perturbation. And so by, by perturbation, what I mean is that here's they give you the target. But as you move your finger there, what they do is that they show your hand out here. So what I'm going to call this is y v which means visual you make an observation visually about the location of your hand of course your hand is actually here you can't see that though but you have a sensor in your body called proprioception which lets you know where your body is so you know even though i can't see my arm i know where it's here why because there's sensors in my arm that tell me what it is i'm going to call that yp which means proprioception so I have two kinds of sensors here. I have things that I can see with my eye. I can things that I can feel with my arm, with my sense of proprioception. And so what has happened is that you show me that my finger is here because what you've done is that you have perturbed something by an amount r. And this r, I'm going to call rv because it's a visual perturbation. It, it has altered the visual representation of my finger from where it would be here to over here. And, and I feel my finger over here, but I see it over here. And of course, what I have to do is with trial after trial, I have to learn to alter this so that if this is the target, what I should do is that so I see my hand there. And of course, for this to happen, so this is YV, it should be at this target, my real hand would be over here. And we're going to call this YP. This is where I feel my hand. This is where I see it. Now, the, the thing is that, that this seems pretty easy to learn. Well, OK, so if you want me to, you know, to perform your task, I need to, I guess, move over here so that I see my finger over here. But if you were not ask people to point to where they think their hand actually is, so the hand is over here. I can't see it. Hand is over there. I see it over here. OK? Now, where is your finger? They point somewhere in between not at where the hand actually is, and not where they see the hand. So the felt position of the hand, I'm going to call it H, H hat is here. Somewhere in between where they feel it and where they see it. Okay, so I want to show you what this means and how to, how to describe it from the point of view of our, um, our state estimation problem. So suppose that what we have is the following model of <coughs> hmm. All right, let me move it up here. So suppose you generate motor command, let's call that U, and you have your hand that is being sensed by these two sensors, vision and proprioception. And so we have the following. So we have our hand that is a state that's being sensed by two sensors, YP and YV. Now, this hand moves because we send motor commands to it. Let's call that U. And we know what these motor commands are because we generate them. So U, I can measure. YV, I can measure. YP, these are my sensors I can measure. Now, there are things in this world that can perturb my sensors. So let's call these RP and RV. 
So these are perturbations that can affect things that I feel and things that I can see. There are also things that can affect the position of my hand. So RU is going to be things that can affect position of my hand. Let me give you an intuition about what this means. So say that you generate a motor command, but there is something that adds forces to what you've done. So maybe you're holding a robot. So if you generate a motor command, the robot is also going to generate a motor command. It's going to produce forces. That's going to be RU. So that where your hand ends up isn't just dependent on the motor commands you generated, you. It also depends on the world out there. And that's RU. Now, so that means your hand depends, your position of your hand depends on you as well as R, um, RU. And you don't know what this RU is. You have to estimate it. The things that you see, say you see a cursor, right? It depends on where your hand really is as well as some perturbation that the experimenter may impose on it. So that, you know, the, what, what you see may depend on where your hand actually is, plus some, some perturbation. Right? And similarly for what you may feel. So in principle, your sensors will give you something about where your hand is, but they're influenced by these, these unknowns, these perturbations. Yeah? When you say forces for RU, uh -huh. is that something you can actually feel against your hand, or is that something that manifests in your consequences? Yeah. So, so I, I don't have a sensor that feels forces. I just have position that I can feel and position that I can see. So in principle, though, you do have these force sensors in your body. You have these kinds of sensors called Golgi tendon organs that maybe they can sense a force when it's pushing against you. Um, but what happens is that um, uh, the reason why I didn't put it in there is because when people learn to move their arm in force fields, after they learn it, the force field is there, of course. They've learned to compensate for it. They, th they tell you you've turned down or turned off the forces. So when they have completely learned it, they think it isn't there anymore. Is that why we're not constantly annoyed at gravity? Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very good point. OK, so this is, a, this is our generative model. It says, I generate a motor command U. I observe Y, V, and Y, P. And you can do things to me through these these states. So let's see what, what happens in this task where um, you give me a target. I'm going to call that Y star. This is my target. And of course, what I want to do is my, my goal is make it so that YV is equal to Y star. So what I observe in terms of where my finger is, I want it to be at the target. That's what the goal of the task is. Take your visual representation of your hand, put it at the target. Now, what I want to show you is that in this framework, these sensory illusions can be explained in terms of the fact that there are many ways by which these perturbations can produce what I observe. There's not a unique perturbation to observation relationship. So in the real experiment, what, what's happened is that you set RV to be, set, say, minus 2 centimeters. That means that if you were to um, move your hand to some location, I'm going to move it to the left by 2 centimeters. And, and you, you all, th this is the truth. RP is 0, RU is 0. This is, this is what you do. But what I see is YP and YV. And my estimate of what these perturbations are will be such to minimize the difference between what I predict and what I actually see. And so I'm going to show you that you know it's very easy to produce scenarios where I see my hand to be at the target, I feel my hand at some other location, and despite that, I end up with these estimates of R's that are not the same as the perturbation, and therefore I end up with a location about where I think my hand is that's different from where it actually is. So this illusion and where it comes about. So let me let me show you, let me show you how to do it. So suppose that um, my my hand in trial n, the location of my hand in trial n, is the motor command that I generate plus my this this perturbation that you give. plus some noise associated with the motor command sigma u. And um, then, of course, what I see, yp and yv, so yp 
in trial n is going to be equal to h of n plus some noise, well, plus rp of n plus sigma p, yv of n is going to be h of n plus rv of n plus sigma v. And um, when so this is what I observe. This is this is my out, this is my measurement equation. This is what I see, and how it depends on my um, hand position plus the um, the perturbations you gave plus some noise. Um, so on any particular trial, what I want to do is to cancel what I believe to be the um, perturbations that you've given me. So um, I'm going to write my h of n is going to be where I'm supposed to go, y star, minus this perturbation that you've given me. And um, so h is this, this term. The expected value of it is going to be um, u of n plus ru is going to be equal to y or V. So the motor command that I generate on trial N is going to be where I'm supposed to go, Y star, minus RV minus RU. So because I want to see my hand at the target, what I will do is produce a command that gets me to the target while canceling for these perturbations. So let's set up a generative model and describe our, our state estimate for, for doing this. Um, and the, I guess before I do it, let me give you intuition about what's going to happen. So RV, the true RV is equal to minus 2. But what I can do is to say, all right, this, I, I see my hand 2 centimeters to the left of the target. So here's the target. I see my hand here. This is what I see, yv. This is where I feel it, yp. This can happen from the following scenario. So you could have given me a 2 centimeter visual perturbation, or you could have given me a 1 centimeter visual perturbation plus a 1 centimeter motor perturbation. So it is possible that you have generated a perturbation to this that has made my hand move to, the, to that side. And you have added this perturbation there. So let me write it down here. Maybe our v hat is equal to minus 1. Our u hat is equal to minus 1. But then how is it that I feel my hand over here? Because our p hat is equal to plus 1. So in this case, you see this cancels this. So I feel my hand over here, but I see my hand over here. Let me go over it one more time. So you feel your hand here. That's yp. You see your hand here. That's yv. That could have come about with this scenario. But it can also come about with the following scenario, a scenario in which r hat v plus r hat u is equal to minus 2, but r hat u plus r hat p is equal to 0. These two cancel so that I feel my hand where it actually is. These two add to give me the visual feedback that you provided. What creates RP? What kind of Perturbation? Any kind of a, well, in principle, any sensor can be um, a sensor that is affected by a perturbation. So in this theory, we assume that each sensor is affected by a perturbation, as well as the, the action that you produce. So what kind of what to not to know where Yeah, yeah. So, so Right, so that your sensor is biased. So despite the fact that your hand here, it feels it over here. OK. Uh, I mean, can we do it uh, artificially, make somebody 
the way the way the way people would do it would be to put vibration on the this is the one way to cause these kinds of illusions would be to put a vibration on the arm if you vibrate the arm then sensors become basically biased if you vibrate this muscle it will think like it's shorter than it actually is you feel like your arm is here oh, yeah. now they actually it's they didn't that do we can't change in them. right so you can't change in it but they didn't do it here oh, okay. we're just saying that in principle the sensors that are measuring things about your body may be perturbed. And in this experiment, if you imagine that it is possible that there is this perturbation, this perturbation, and this perturbation, the fact that you see your hand here and you feel it here, would, this is what it means. For the, the, it means that for this, this thing has to be true. That's, and so this is just one, this is just one solution that gives us this condition. It could be others as well. So let me write the generative model for this and we'll do state estimation. So let's call our state variable x all the things that we don't know, which are, uh, I'm going to start with I guess rv, rp, ru, and hand location. So this is my state that I want to estimate. I have x in trial n plus 1 is equal to a times x in trial n plus b times u of n plus some noise sigma which has some variance q and then my observation y of n is going to be c times x plus another noise with variance q, variance r. So what is this a? Let's look at this A matrix here. Um, this is going to be, I'm going to put little a v, little a p, little a u, and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. This is going to be um, hand position. It's going to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then B is going to be 0, 0, 0, 1. So let's see what I wrote. I have this X, which is the matrix, describe, sorry, the vector describing the state. My hand position is going to be equal to A times X, which is going to be um, RU from this term here, plus 1 times U. So where your hand position is, is going to be equal to the motor command you generated plus the perturbation onto the, um, so this is this equation. Question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This this equation is the the bottom row of this equation. And every other equation is this. R U N plus one is equal to A R U of N plus sigma U. R V of n plus one is equal to A U A V R R V of n plus sigma V, and then the same for R P. Yeah. Why does the next hand position depend on the previous position? Because the hand position only depends on the current U. The motor command that you generate now alters the state of the hand. That's the only thing it depends on, plus the perturbation now. So okay. what, what I wrote here, what I wrote here is as follows. I'm assuming that the perturbations are not forever. They're going to have some decay properties to them. Whatever you're perturbing me with, they're not going to be you know, forever. That at some point, if you, nothing else happens, they're going to go away. So this means this A here, AU, AV, AP, is going to be almost 1, but not quite 1. There's going to be something like 0.99 or something. 
which means that, that these perturbations that you're giving me, I'm going to estimate them, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that from trial to trial, you know, they're going to be almost the same, but if nothing else happens, they're going to decay away. The other thing that I've written here is that the, that hand, this hand position here, is going to depend on the motor command, U, and the perturbation that you gave it. So just to be clear, what, what, it, what this really says is that this, this perturbation depends on U. U is here that generate, generates the movement, and then it causes, it's affected by RU to give me my hand position. Does, does that make sense? No. Well, H is, uh, H is hand position, which is a hidden variable. I don't know what it is. It on, uh, it, here it is. Look at it. It depends on U, and it depends on RU. You see it? It depends on, right? It depends on H, depends on RU, here it is, RU, and it depends on U. Right, so, so remember, RU is the third quantity here. That's what this is. So I'm saying that hand position depends on RU and U. Do you see it? OK, so that's the only one that depends on U. All right, so here's a state equation. Now what about C? So C is going to be a 2 by 4. Let's see, let, what are the things that we can observe? So we can observe YV and YP. What does YV depend on? YV depend on H and RV. So RV is my first term, 0, 0, 1. And then YP is this term here, depends on H, and it depends on RP. So that's my, that's my model. Yeah? So YM is YP over MYP. Mm -hmm. It's a vector. Mm -hmm. Right, because I have two things that I can see. So, let's do state estimation. On every trial, I'm going to generate a command u, I'm going to predict the sensory consequences y, and I'm going to learn from the difference between what I observe and from what I, um, what I predicted. So I begin with prior beliefs, with r's, and so, so I begin with, you know, a usual. I have x hat of n given n minus 1. This is my prior belief. So I generate a command u. And so what is my command? That I generate u of n is going to be equal to the target that I'm trying to get to, y star, minus what I'm trying to compensate for, which are um, x hat v n given n minus 1 minus x hat um, u, or I should call these r, I guess. So these are the, these are the components of x, r and u. So I'm going to generate a command that gets me to the target by canceling for the visual perturbation and canceling for the, um, uh, the motor perturbation. All right, so if I do that, what's my prediction about where, where my hand is going to go? Then my prediction is that y hat of n, wh what I'm going to see, is going to be equal to the command that I generated. It's going to be y star um, uh, 
it's going to be then line c times x. So it's going to be c times x hat of n given n minus 1. That's where I expect to see my, uh, my prediction. So now how am I going to learn? I'm going to have x hat of n given n is going to be equal to x hat of n given n minus 1 plus my common gain times the difference between what I see and what I predicted. And so my common gain is going to be the usual relationship between my prior uncertainty times c times um, the uncertainty of the observation, which is c p of n n minus 1 c transpose plus r minus 1. Let's see if the, 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 the units work out. So p is a 4 by 4. C is a 2 by 4, so this is a transpose here. And um, R is a 2 by 2. This works out. And I have P of n given n is equal to I minus K of n times C times P of n, n minus 1. That's my posterior uncertainty after I make my estimate. And now, what's my prior uncertainty on the next trial? That's going to be x hat of n plus 1 given n is going to be equal to a times x hat of n given n um, plus b times u of n, or u of n plus 1, I guess. This is my prior belief is going to be on the next trial. And my prior uncertainty on the next trial is going to be um, uh, that equation, which is um, a p of n given n a transpose plus q. Oh yeah, my pen is running out. All right, so let me go over this slowly. So I have a posterior estimate from my prior estimate and from my observation error. I have a common gain that depends on my prior uncertainty and my measurement uncertainty. I form a posterior uncertainty and then for the next trial I send things a step forward by using those, those equations. So my prior, my prior estimate on the next trial is going to be my previous plus b times u, and my posterior, my, my, my prior uncertainty on the next trial is going to be my previous uncertainty multiplied by the uncertainty associated with a and, and a transpose plus, plus q. All right. So now why does this give you the data that I showed you? Why should this give you this, this uncertainty when you simulate this? Here's what happens. Um, if you have, let's begin with, say that y star is equal to 1. So this is the place you're supposed to go. You're supposed to put your hand at 1. And, and you know, you, this is where your hand actually is. So here's, here's, here's y star is equal to 1. Your hand is there. And now all of a sudden, you give a perturbation. So now all of a sudden, the perturbation begins. So down here, I have r. This is r now at 0. And this is RV. RV now all of a sudden goes to minus 2. It goes to minus 2. Uh, here's minus 1. Here's minus 2. So at this point, this is RV. It goes to minus 2. What happens to my estimate of things? So my hand is going to slowly go to plus 3. This is h, the actual hand position. Um, my estimate of rv is going to go down here someplace, rv hat. And then my estimate of ru is going to be the difference between these two. It's going to be some here. It's here r hat u. 
and now our hat P is going to go here, and my estimate of where my hand actually is is going to do this, H hat. So what has happened is that you gave this perturbation with this generative model that I have up there, depending on my model, I say, well, you know, this error that I'm seeing, some part of it is could it could be because of the perturbation, but also part of it could be because of the perturbation to be given to other parts of my system, R U and R P. And in that scenario, what happens is that I I have, you know, what I'm trying to do is minimize the difference between what I observe and what I predict. And what I observe and what I predict is the two sensory modalities, vision and proprioception. I feel my hand over here, I see my hand over here, and this can be explained by this division of the perturbations. And if that's the case, then I get my hand somewhere in between. Yeah. Is there a consistent kind of, uh, like, preference for a certain uh, type of observation being perturbed, like in, in the estimate? Uh -huh. Like, do we always think that, like, or there, is there some preference for vision over that would be associated with the noise in each. So remember when we were doing the um, uh, maximum likelihood, and you had noise in your, in your, in your the way you feel things, and noise in what you see things, and the noise in what you feel is about three times the size of the noise in what you what you see. So what you see, you believe a lot more. Right. Okay. And and you see in that case, I I put this R V to be a lot closer to R V hat. Than, than are you. So you, you believe what you see in this case because the noises and what you see is pretty small. But it isn't, it isn't zero. So the resulting mixture of mm -hmm. um, credit assignments. Due to the fact that the. Un and R yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so, so the uncertainty associated with what you see um, and what you feel is not something that is, you know so big that makes it so that you only believe that it can only be a visual perturbation. Yeah. So the, there, is, there is this distribution of the, the credit to the various sensors that could have failed, that could have been biased, and that makes it so that there is um, this potential. So this is, just a, this is just a model that says, here's one way by which to explain why there is this illusion associated with where you think you're in. So remember, the, the basic data is as follows. You learn to do this in order to see your hand go here. But at the end of training, your hand is really here. You see the cursor here. Somehow you feel your hand is in between. Why does that happen? This says because here's where you feel your hand to be. Because some of the perturbation that you are learning to estimate has been assigned to things that really weren't perturbations at all. Did nobody actually perturb you there, but you end up with this illusion. All right, any questions? All right, so the last thing I want to show you is um, an experiment that is, is a bit similar to um, backwards blocking that uh, David talked to you about, which is basically a scenario where an animal is learning under two contexts. And there's this curious result that um, the specific way that they learn depends on the prior history of it. And the way the way the backwards blocking worked was that there were two cues. There was light and sound. And if the animal learned something with light and sound, it affected how it would then learn with just light alone. And the idea is that in this state estimation framework, the past history of how you learned will influence how you will learn now because of what has happened in the uncertainty matrix. So if what you learned in the past said that there's this covariance between the parameters, then that alters how you're going to learn when only one of the parameters is present. So the history of what you learn is reflected in that uncertainty matrix P. Because the uncertainty matrix P keeps track of what has happened in the past here. And so if you happen to learn when most of the times the two Qs were on together, that means that there's going to be this negative covariance in your uncertainty matrix. That's going to alter how you're going to learn in the future. So here's the, here's the basic experimental data that I want to talk to you about. And then we'll do the math to show you the, the framework to put it in. So the experiment was like this. They, they did an experiment where 
they move the hand like this and as they move the hand there was this you know projector that covered the hand and there was a screen and on top of it there's a cursor that moved and then in another condition they moved the wrist like this and first of all what they found was that, so again you know they're moving the wrist they found that you know again there's this cursor that moves and and you know depending on direction of the wrist movement the cursor is moving so in both conditions are very simple you know you move the hand the cursor moves you move the wrist and the cursor moves and I don't I don't remember exactly the you know I guess the plane maybe maybe at, maybe we should think about it moving like this or moving like this so both in the vertical plane so um, the, the, the curious thing was, first of all, people learned to do this a lot faster than this. So that's kind of odd, you know, why should you learn when it's with your wrist faster than, you know, with the whole arm? The second thing they found was that when they learned with the arm, and now they learned with the wrist, it transferred. So learning with the arm helped with the wrist. But learning with the wrist didn't help with the arm. So there was this asymmetric transfer. This action helped learning with this, but this action didn't help learning with this. So that was the curious result. There was three things here. One, wrist association with this cursor movement somehow was learned faster than arm. Two, arm transfers to wrist. Three, wrist doesn't transfer to arm. What the heck's going on? So we'll set this up, again using a state estimation framework, and we'll see why this comes out of the uns this uncertainty matrix. And it basically goes back to when we did the blocking experiment, which means that the history of how you learn influences the current ability to learn. So in the past, when we were thinking about blocking, we had two kinds of cues. We had light and we had dark. Oh, sorry, we had light and we had sound. Right? So here, we have two kinds of contexts. We have wrist, and then we have arm. But the important thing to realize is that when you move your arm, you also move your wrist. So the cute thing in this mathematical framework is to recognize that wrist is a part of the arm. And when the arm moves, the wrist moves with it. But when the wrist moves, the arm doesn't have to move with it. That's the idea. So, we're going to have a context, just like before when we had light and sound, but now the context of moving the arm includes the context of moving the wrist. But the context of moving the wrist does not include moving the arm. Right? Because when I do this, I don't move my arm. But when I do this, I move my wrist. That's the idea. So by setting up the problem this way, then you do get this funny thing where Learning the wrist is going to be faster than learning the arm. Learning the arm transfers to the wrist. Learning the wrist doesn't transfer to the arm. So let me show you how that works. Okay, so so I'm going to have two contexts. Ah. I'm going to call this C, my context. And when I am in the arm context, I'm moving both my wrist and my arm, my upper arm. And this, this is my arm context. But when I'm just moving my wrist, I'm just moving my wrist. That's what I mean by this context. OK, so um, you're going to have this display where you're going to show me this cursor. And it's going to be attached to my finger. Let's call this E, I guess, my finger. I'll call it F. So I'm going to see a cursor on trial N. And that's going to depend on where my finger is. And you're going to add some perturbation to it called R. And you know, that's my, and then some noise associated with it, no, epsilon y. Let's see. Um, 
Now, this R is going to depend on, I'm going to, my model says, this R depends on C transpose times W, and these W's are the things that I'm going to try to estimate. So I'm going to estimate your R, the perturbation that you're giving me, based on which context I'm in and some weights associated with those, um, with those, uh, uh, with those contexts. So what this means is that you know, what I'm seeing, this R, this equation, it's going to have context in it depending on this, this scenario. So I have some target that you give me, Y star. That's my target. That's where I'm supposed to take the cursor. And I'm going to generate U on trial N. So that's equal to Y star minus R hat. So you know, whatever I believe the perturbation to be, I'm going to try to cancel it so that I get to the target. And um, the, the key thing in this, in this set, in this set of equations that, that we have, uh, I, I'm also going to have my state, state, state equation, I guess, X of n plus 1 is equal to um, A X of n plus B U of n plus epsilon x. And um, what is x? It's going to be the things that I don't know, which is going to be w1, w2. So this is for um, the weight associated with each context, so, so I can get the, um, so I can get the, uh, and then my finger position, my estimate of r plus the finger. So the state that I'm trying to estimate are the weights associated with this perturbation that you're giving me so that I can, I can predict how much of a perturbation is that are going to be in each context plus where my finger is. This is the state that I'm trying to estimate. I have some command u that I give um, and that changes the state from trial to trial and this is my observation equation. So this is my measurement equation and this is my um, state equation. So the key idea in these simulations is that what is the uncertainty matrix P going to look like? Well, if you have a scenario where you move your arm and that movement of the arm includes this, um, this movement of the wrist, then your uncertainty matrix P of for, for this, for this uh, state, state vector um, let, let's forget about f for now. So, so this is going to be that the bottom row is going to be for f, and the right column is going to be for f, the uncertainty of where the finger is. But most, most important is this 2 by 2 matrix here that tells me my uncertainty about w1 and w2. And if I have a scenario where movement of the arm causes movement of the wrist, then what that happens, when that happens, is that basically these, cr these off diagonal terms are going to be negative numbers these two terms here. Of course, these two are going to be positive numbers, which are going to be my variances associated with my estimate of the w1 and w2, but these two terms are going to be negative, which means that every time I move my arm, I also move my wrist. Okay, so in a scenario where movement of the arm causes movement of the wrist, but movement of the wrist does not cause movement of the arm, you have this negative covariance on the off-diagonal off -diagonal terms of the uncertainty matrix. So now, let's consider a scenario where you do wrist training. You take somebody and you have them just move the wrist for them to, to produce the task. So in that case, now C is equal to 0, 1. So C is equal to 0, 1. You know C is equal to 0, 1. In these equations, you know what C is. It's equal to 0, 1. So in this case, when c is equal to 0, 1, what's going to happen to the, um, to, the, to the learning process? So you're going to estimate, um, so here's some trial number, and you're going to give a perturbation, say you know, r um, is going to be equal to plus 30 degrees. So th that's, that's how the, um, the, the, the task begins. And what happens is that these errors slowly go away, and you know, the, the, the the, the system learns to cancel this perturbation. R hat gets better and better. So here's your R hat. You learn it. But the way you learn it is based on this W1 and W2. And the W1 and W2 look like this. So W1 is associated with the wrist. W2 is associated with the arm. And what happens is that you learn that um, 
for, um, for the wrist, there is this perturbation. And so W1 increases. And as W1 increases, W2 decreases. So the sum, W1 plus 2, is, is here at, uh, at, at 0. So basically, you learn there's a perturbation to the wrist. And for that to happen, because of the negative covariance here, the perturbation to the arm moves in the opposite direction. Now, if you have a scenario where C is equal to 1, 1, where it's the, the arm is moving, what happens is that your, these negative covariances make it so that you're going to learn slower. It'll look like this. Using the exact same initial condition, the system will learn slower that perturbation. And now, here's what happens. W1 goes here, W2 goes here. The sum of those two is going to be equal to plus 30. So in this scenario, if you were to, so W1 is how much you credit you assign to the wrist. W2 is how much credit you assigned to the arm. What happens is that if you if you learn the arm condition, you've also learned something about the wrist, so therefore you're better at it. So all of a sudden you show transfer. Here, you're no better at learning the arm because what you learned put the move the estimate of W2 in the opposite direction. So assume if one assumes that this context matrix is as follows, that in this condition it's a 1, 1, in this condition it's a 0, 1, the uncertainty matrix ends up having a negative covariance when you move the arm. And in that condition, you end up with scenario where um, when one moves up, the other one moves down. And when you do the arm, both of them move up. And this gives you the three qualities that we had. One, in the risk condition, the system learns faster. Two, in the arm condition, it transfers to the wrist. And three, in the wrist condition, it doesn't transfer to the arm, this asymmetric transfer. All comes from this uncertainty matrix and the way the, the uh, C plays a role in it. OK? So the it it um, in this in this condition the wrist actually doesn't move with respect to the arm it just is carried with it so it, it's it's like impossible to just do this right to not move the wrist but just move the arm it would, ha yeah, would be very strange right. so it's, but it did um, it, the wrist wasn't moving relative to the arm yes it wasn't moving it was relative perfect. to the arm yeah yeah. So basically, it just boils down to the two experimental paradigms allow your state estimation to explore different subspaces of like the total yeah. state space. You know, remember a few weeks ago you were saying how it's not an observable system? These are all examples of that. There's no unique solution. So it's just that when you change the C matrix, you're changing the particular <coughs> subspace of parameter space that you're able to observe. Right, right. Exactly. And the way, the way uh, that observation takes place, the estimation takes place, is all based on the uncertainty matrix. Uncertainty matrix is telling you the weighting of how to distribute the error. So when you see, so in this case, when you see your hand in one location and feel it in the other location, the uncertainty matrix, through the common gain, tells you how to distribute that error to the various things you're trying to estimate. And so it, it gives you the credit assignment. And that credit assignment depends on the very critical thing, which is your generative model. So, I, I, so in these, all these exercises, I start with writing a set of equations that says, this is the truth. This is the way the, the data that I'm observing is generated. So the important thing, of course, to realize is that that's just a guess. We don't really know how the learner is learning. All we can say is that if this is the basis by which they generated guesses, then the learning that they did would be you know, following these equations. So we start with the generative model. Now, in a couple of lectures away, 
what we're going to think about is, that, well, who gives us a generative model? You know, how do you know this is the right model to begin with? How do you know that A? How do you know the relationship between X and Y? How do you know that C? Right, so where does that come from? How many hidden states are there? You know, I'm, I'm assuming that X is the structure to it, right? Well, how do I know that? Where does that come from? So that's a kind of learning that's, that's, that you can think of it in terms of structural learning. It's also is, um, system identification. There, what we, what we do is that we just make observations and we have to say, okay, what, what was the system that generated it? And the system identification or structural learning is about not finding X, but finding A and B. So, of course, if I knew A and B, I, I can tell you what X's are because that's what we've been doing. But the next problem is how do we find um, A's and B's? Okay. Thank you very much. See you Monday.